the ultimate horror story of all time, begins with a train ride to Eastern Europe. It's the 1890s, a time when most of Europe was embracing modernity. But, as you'll see, there are some places that prefer to exist in the distant past. Jonathan Harker, one of our main protagonists, or main characters, is a young lawyer from Exeter in England. His boss, Mr Hawkins, is sending him to Transylvania to see a special client, a nobleman who lives in a castle named after him. Guess who that might be? We learn all the details of Jonathan's journey through his journal. As he travels from Germany into Transylvania, Jonathan notes the culture shift. The further east he goes, the more foreign everything feels. He also notices how the local people cling to old superstitions. And it's not long before even he starts having strange dreams and hearing things in the night. When Jonathan reaches a hotel in Bistritz, he's handed a letter. It welcomes him to my beautiful land and tells him about the next leg of his journey. The letter is from Jonathan's special client, Count Dracula. Jonathan soon notices how people seem frightened for him. The hotel owner hands him a crucifix to wear, while other people cross themselves, make hand signs against the evil eye, and mutter alarming words. It all seems ridiculous, but Jonathan is unnerved. His journey from Bistritz into the Carpathian Mountains is a bumpy nine-hour ride. Near midnight, as promised, Jonathan's coach is met by a smaller carriage. It's pulled by four dark horses and driven by a tall, bearded man. Goodness, look at his eyes and those teeth. Next stop, Castle Dracula. The ride is terrifying and bizarre. They're chased by wolves and the driver keeps stopping near blue flames that appear by the roadway. Every time he sees a blue flame, the driver hops down, walks over to it and arranges some stones. Jonathan can't make any sense of it. But at one point, he's sure they're all about to be food for the wolves. Astonishingly, the driver commands the pack to retreat and they obey. Eventually, they pull into the courtyard of a vast castle. Welcome to Castle Dracula. After a lengthy wait, the giant door swings open and there he is, Count Dracula in the flesh. Jonathan is impressed by the Count's appearance and excellent English, although his handshake is bone-crushing and his skin is ice cold. The Count leads Jonathan up to a large room with a roaring fireplace and a table set for supper. He also shows Jonathan through to his bedroom, which is beautifully furnished and has its own fireplace. What a relief. After supper, they sit by the fire and Jonathan gets a better look at his host. His features are unique, especially his sharp white teeth and hairy palms. When the Count draws near, Jonathan feels a wave of nausea. Ugh, his breath stinks. Near dawn, the wolves begin to howl. Jonathan finds it chilling, but the Count loves their music. As he goes to bed, Jonathan feels uneasy and utters a short prayer. Will it be heard? After a day or so, Jonathan starts to relax a bit. Although he does notice something very odd. The Count doesn't seem to have any servants. Towards evening, the Count meets Jonathan in the library. By the look of things, the Count has been closely studying all aspects of English life. He says he longs to walk London's busy streets, speak flawless English and feel at home there. In fact, that's why Jonathan is there to help the Count purchase a property in England. As they chat, the topics become darker and stranger. The Count warns Jonathan not to try any of the castle's locked doors. They're locked for good reason. He also explains the blue flames that Jonathan saw during his journey. On that night of the year, the eve of St George's Day, 
evil spirits are active and blue flames appear over hidden treasure. Since the region has such a long history of wars and invasions, the Carpathian Mountains hold centuries worth of buried treasure. But local people are too scared and superstitious to go out and look for it. The conversation then steers back to the Count's purchase of Carfax Abbey, a large but very gloomy estate outside of London. Its closest neighbour is a lunatic asylum. When the Count steps out of the room, Jonathan sees a map of England with three areas circled, Carfax Abbey, Exeter and Whitby. What's the Count up to? The next morning, Jonathan is shaving in his room when the Count enters, startling him. Jonathan accidentally cuts his own face with the blade. When he looks into the mirror to check, he gets another fright. The Count's reflection isn't there. Then, when Jonathan turns his bloodied face towards the Count, the Count's eyes blaze and he grabs Jonathan by the throat. But when his icy fingers touch the beads of Jonathan's crucifix, the Count draws back. He then launches Jonathan's mirror out of the window. What on earth was that all about? Later, Jonathan tries to explore the castle, but he doesn't get very far. There are doors everywhere, all of them locked. With deep horror and panic, Jonathan finally realises he's a prisoner. After briefly losing his mind, Jonathan sits quietly to think. He decides to keep his fears to himself because the Count isn't silly, he's the jailer. But why is he doing this? When Jonathan retreats to his bedroom, he finds the Count making his bed. So it's true, there are no servants. The Count is master, driver, cook and housekeeper. He marked the buried treasure and he commanded the wolves. Who is this guy? During their nightly chat, the Count gives Jonathan a detailed rundown of his ancestral history. He speaks about the medieval wars as if he was there. Surely not. On another occasion, the Count reveals his aptitude for English law and business. He asks Jonathan about banking, shipping and hiring agents in various English ports. It sounds like he's after more than just a holiday home. A vast corporate empire, perhaps? He also gets Jonathan to write home, saying that he'll be staying on with the Count for another month. But he warns Jonathan to keep the tone of his letters calm and businesslike. As the Count collects Jonathan's letters, he issues another warning. Don't fall asleep in any other part of the castle. If he does, he'll suffer terrible nightmares. Later that night, Jonathan goes to a window for some much-needed fresh air. As he looks down, he sees the Count climb out of the window below. He then scales down the castle wall, face first, like a lizard. Jonathan is paralysed with terror. What kind of creature is this? The next time the Count does his lizard trick, Jonathan looks for a way out of the castle. Most of the doors are locked, but one gives way on its hinges. Jonathan then finds himself in an old, dusty wing of the castle. It's peaceful in there, so he sits down to write in his journal, until he gets sleepy. Uh-oh. He wakes to find he has company, three beautiful young ladies. Jonathan is afraid, but also hopes they will kiss him. He lays there stunned as one of them leans over him. But just as she's about to sink her teeth into his neck, the Count swoops in. He rips the woman off Jonathan and shoos the others away angrily. When they protest, the Count promises them they can kiss Jonathan all they want when he's finished with him. Then he gives them a bag containing something that sounds like a crying child. Jonathan watches in horror as the women melt through the window like shadows, carrying the dreadful bag. He then passes out. Jonathan wakes up the following morning in his bedroom. He figures the Count must have carried him there. 
Luckily, he didn't take Jonathan's journal out of his pocket. Jonathan tries to enter that old wing of the castle again in daylight, but the door is locked fast. He concludes that his encounter with the women was no mere nightmare. A short time later, the Count gets Jonathan to write three more letters home, all dated nearly a month in advance. The Count gives suave excuses about the slow Transylvanian postal system, but Jonathan isn't fooled. He now knows how long he has left to live. One day, Jonathan sees a chance to escape. A group of Romany men set up camp in the courtyard, presumably to do some work for the Count. Jonathan quickly pens letters to his fiancée, Mina, and Mr Hawkins, throws them down to one of the men and makes pleading signs for them to be posted. The man bows and takes the letters. But later that evening, the Count shows the letters to Jonathan. So much for that plan. One morning, two wagons enter the courtyard, driven by Slovaks. They're delivering large, empty wooden boxes. Jonathan tries to run down but finds that he's been locked in his room. When he cries out to them from his window, they just look up at him, laugh and turn away. The next time Jonathan sees the Count crawl out of the castle, he's carrying that dreadful bag. Hours later, Jonathan hears a cry come from the Count's room, followed by an awful silence. Soon after this, a woman runs into the courtyard, shrieking. The Count has taken her child, but her suffering is soon ended when the Count summons the wolves to devour her. Jonathan is now desperate to find the key to the castle's great door. One morning, he climbs down the castle wall and into the Count's room. In one corner, there's a huge pile of gold, priceless medieval treasures from all different countries, but very dusty and dirty. It must have been buried for centuries. In another corner is a door. Jonathan enters it and creeps down the narrow, steep passageways. At last, he finds a ruined chapel. He sees that the soil has been dug up and shoveled into the boxes brought by the Slovaks. Venturing further down into the vaults, Jonathan finds the Count, asleep with his eyes open, on top of the soil in one of the boxes. Jonathan tries to search the Count for a key, but he's freaked out by the Count's eyes and flees. One evening, the Count tells Jonathan that he'll be returning to England the following day. Wait, what? Jonathan tests the Count by asking if he can go that very night. He'd be happy to walk. With devilish glee, the Count escorts Jonathan to the front door, opens it and shows him what he'd be walking into. The wolves. No go. That night, Jonathan hears whispering outside his bedroom door. It's the three women. The Count tells them to back off. They can't have him until tomorrow night. In the morning, Jonathan returns to the Count's daytime hideout. When he finds him, the Count looks younger and full of blood. Jonathan searches frantically for a key, but there's nothing, just a mocking smile on the Count's lips. What will happen when this monster gets to England? Horrified by the idea, Jonathan picks up a shovel and raises it to smash the Count's face in. As he brings it down, the Count looks straight at Jonathan, giving him a jolt of terror. The shovel turns in Jonathan's hand, glances off the Count's forehead and knocks the lid onto his box. Jonathan starts to lose hope, but then hears the Slovaks and Romany return with their big wagons. He darts back up the passageways, desperate to meet them when they enter the castle. Finally, a chance to escape. But alas, a sudden, violent force slams the door shut behind Jonathan, imprisoning him in the Count's room. Below, he hears the men heaving all the earth-laden boxes out of the crypt and onto their wagons. As they leave, they lock the castle door behind them. Jonathan's only chance now is to scale down the castle walls and run while it's still daylight, 
One slip and he's done for, but Jonathan thinks falling is better than being eaten. Will he make it? We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.